If you would, please turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. I mentioned a couple times in the weeks leading up to today that I'd be preaching from the book of Luke as we led up to Christmas. Uh, after last Sunday, when Cameron uh, preached for us from John chapter 1, verses 1 through 18, I, uh, I spent some time thinking and in prayer, uh, and I thought that continuing through this first portion of the book of John uh, would be even more fitting for the Christmas season that we're entering into these weeks leading up to Christmas. Uh, so, today, uh, rather than going with my original plan, we're jumping into John chapter 1, verses 19 through 28. Let me read this text for us today, uh, and then we'll pray and continue, uh, continue to study the text together. Let's, uh, let's read. Hear from the word of the Lord in John chapter 1. And this is the testimony of John, when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, No. So they said to him, Who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, Then why are you baptizing if you are neither the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, I baptize with water, but among you stands one you do not know. Even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. These things took place in Bethany, across the Jordan, where John was baptizing. Uh, church, let's pray together, having heard the word of the Lord. O oh Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for... Uh, the book of John that teaches us about Jesus. Thank you for sending your son Jesus to, um, to take on flesh, to live a perfect life, to die for our sins, and then to raise again. We pray, Lord, that you would help us understand your word this morning, and that we would, would hear it and listen to it and uh, respond to your word appropriately, respond in action and in faithfulness toward you. Help us, Lord, to love you more and more from hearing your word this morning. We do, Lord, love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, church, let's take a pretty close look here at John chapter 1, verses 19 through 28. Last week, Cameron read for us the first 18 verses of the book of John. Uh, and he shared with us that these 18 verses are an introduction to the entire book as a whole. And they summarize the, the main theme, the, the main big idea of the book of John, which is... That Jesus is God in the flesh. That uh, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. And then in verse 14, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The eternal Son of God, who existed with God forever from eternity, who was himself God, took on flesh, assumed humanity, became like us so that we, humans, may be redeemed and God may be glorified uh, through redeeming us and through saving us. So we saw that Jesus was God the Son in the flesh, a clear proclamation from the author of the book of John from the very beginning. Later in the book of John, right at the end, John states uh, the purpose, why he's proclaiming this message that God became flesh on our behalf. And the purpose was so that the readers and all the readers might interact with may believe and know that Jesus Christ is truly the Son of God. Amen. With that purpose in mind, John wants his readers to know and believe truly that Jesus is the Son of God. John continues, after the introductory 18 verses, to give us evidence that Jesus himself is the Son of God. And here in verses 19 through 28, we get further evidence that Jesus truly is who John claims that he is in verses 1 through 18. John claims that Jesus is the eternal Son of God, become flesh, and he's going to give us some evidence of that in verses 19 through 28. 
And the evidence is that God sent a prophet before Jesus to proclaim that the Messiah was coming, and the Messiah is indeed right on their doorstep. Look, look with me at verse 19, uh, and we'll see uh, what happens at the beginning of our text. Verse 19 reads this way. And this is the testimony of John, when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? We see some priests and Levites coming from Jerusalem, the capital city of Israel. And they travel out into the wilderness to see this man named John who has been baptizing people in the Jordan River. This uh, delegation of people that comes to John really can be described as a delegation. These people are official. They're priests and Levites. The priests served in the temple of God and the Levites uh, helped the priests. They, they uh, oversaw the worship that happened on and some of the sacrifices that happened at the temple. The priests performed the sacrifices and the Levites uh, oversaw and helped the priests with anything that they needed help with. And so we see a, a delegation of priests and Levites from the Jews. They come out to John and they ask John, who are you? In verse 20, John responds, he confessed and he did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. I am not the Christ. In ancient Israel at that time, uh, ritual cleansing in water, uh, they might have called it baptizing often, was usually done for oneself and by oneself. You would do a ritual cleansing, a ritual baptism for yourself and by yourself in a pool of water. But the fact that a man named John comes out and is baptizing other people for the repentance of sins, baptizing them in water, caused the, uh, the Jewish leaders to scratch their heads and question, who is this person? And there seems to be an implied question, are you baptizing because you're the Messiah? Because he responds, no, I'm not the Messiah. I am not the Christ. John states very emphatically in verse 20 that John the Baptist never, never once claimed to be the Messiah. Look how emphatically he says in verse 20, he confessed and he did not deny, but indeed he confessed, I am not the Christ. I am not the Messiah. I am not the promised one that God said he would send into the world to redeem the world from its sin and from its enemies. So John gets this question, who are you, with the, the implied, are you the one that God has promised to send to save us? And John says, no, that's not me. In verse 21, they continue to question him. They ask him this, look, look at verse 21 with me. Uh, and the, the priests and the Levites asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, no. They first suspected that maybe he's proclaiming himself as the Messiah, the promised one from God, because he's out here baptizing other people. But when he said he's not, they, they move on to the next few logical candidates. They said, well, if he's not the Messiah, maybe he is the promised Elijah, who God said would come before the Messiah. Uh, in Malachi chapter 4, verse 5, the prophet Malachi predicts, prophesies, uh, from God, under the inspiration of God, that Elijah would come to prepare the way for the Lord. That before the, the day of the Lord comes, Elijah would come once again to, to get ready. John the Baptist himself uh, looks at himself and in his own estimation says, Oh, I, I don't claim to be, to be that important of a figure. I'm, I'm not Elijah. I don't claim that for myself. Uh, and then they ask, are you the prophet? Uh, in Deuteronomy 18, verses 15 through 18, uh, Moses, uh, under the influence of God, uh, predicts and prophesies that a prophet would come also to prepare the way of the Lord, uh, to prepare for the end of times, uh, to prepare for the last days when God's Messiah would come and save the people. And Elijah says, no, that's not me either. Verse 22, they ask him again. They say, uh, who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? What do you say about yourself? They say, well, we've asked you if you're Elijah. We've asked if you're the prophet. We've, uh, and you say no to all these things. Why then are you baptizing? But we, we've got to go back to the people who sent us, and we've got to give them an answer for who do you say that you are. Uh, under what authority do you baptize people like no one else has done before? 
In verse 23, he responds to them. He says, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. So when they, they confront John and they ask him, are you Elijah? Are you the prophet? He says, no, I don't claim personally to be either of those things. But here's what I do claim. I claim that God has sent me to prepare, to, to make straight the way of the Lord, as is quoted in Isaiah. This quote comes from Isaiah 40, verse 3, right at the beginning of the new, a new section of Isaiah, where God promises comfort to his people uh, when they, in the future, are exiled because of their sin and their wickedness before God's eyes. He promises comfort, and he promises to make a straight path for them so that they may come back into God's promises, and they may again be redeemed by God and loved by God. Uh, so Isaiah promises that someone would come and in the wilderness proclaim for the people to make a straight path for the Lord. And Isaiah claimed, or John the Baptist claims to be this very person. Later on in Jesus' ministry, someone would come and say, Hey, Jesus, we know that you're the Messiah, but isn't Elijah supposed to come before you get here? And Jesus himself says, yes, Elijah must come. And Elijah has indeed come. And Jesus points back to John the Baptist and says, John the Baptist was indeed Elijah. Elijah, in his own estimation, in his own eyes, he didn't attain to that position of Elijah, but Jesus, reflecting that and with uh, full authority and power of God, looked at John and said, even though he didn't see himself this way, he truly was the promised Elijah, uh, that promised prophet who would come and prepare the way for the Lord. And as John himself said, he was, like Isaiah said, the one who would come to make straight the way for the Lord. So even though John didn't see himself this way, Jesus would later come back and retroactively apply uh, the prophecies of Elijah onto John the Baptist. So even though John didn't see himself as fulfilling that, that specific role or prophecy of Elijah, John definitely saw his ministry as significant, for he states, I am able to baptize because God has sent me to do so, as Isaiah promised in Isaiah chapter 40. In verses 24 through 28, they again question his authority to baptize. Uh, the, look at verse 24. We learn a little bit more about the people who would come. Now, they had been sent from the Pharisees, or, or they had come out from the Pharisees, which, uh, which would be another way to state this text here. Uh, this text is indicating that at least some of the people in this delegation, these priests and Levites, were among a group called the Pharisees. The Pharisees were a group of Jews who, who all held to a very rigid, very strict, very rigorous way of pursuing faithfulness to the Jewish law. The Jewish law had 613 commands, and the Pharisees heaped up thousands of additional commands so that they could make sure to stay far, far away from breaking any one of the commands found in the law of Moses. Uh, the Pharisees, as compared to some of the other Jews, believed in hope for in they believed in the resurrection from the dead some of the other jews uh, like the sadducees did not believe that there would one day be a resurrection from the dead they didn't believe that the dead uh, who had died before them like abraham isaac and jacob, jacob continued to live in the father's bosom as the pharisees did uh, so these pharisees were looking forward to not only the messiah but also to this resurrection from the dead and they were very, very strict, and they heaped up additional rules and regulations on themselves so that they would not get even close to breaking God's law. John wants to indicate that the people here uh, seem to be people of respect, people who, by all of the other Jews, seem to be very rigorous in their, their, uh, their adherence to their own rules, their own laws, to their own religion. I think verse 24 is, again, another indication that the people who have come to, to question John the Baptist are serious people sent with authority. Uh, they seem to be sent by a leading group of Jews in, in Jerusalem. Uh, they're, they're people with uh, that the guard the respect of those around them. They are Pharisees. So these people come, and let's read verse 25 and see, again, another question that they ask him. Verse 25, they asked him, then why are you baptizing if you are neither the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? I think this is clearly a question of authority. What authority do you, John, have to come and to baptize people for the 
repentance of sins. People baptize themselves. They do ritual cleansing themselves. Why are you coming in uh, under your own authority, apparently, baptizing others? They question, how can he do this if he is not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? Let's hear John's response in verse 26. John answered them, I baptize with water, but among you stands one you do not know. Even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. John says that his role from God, his message, his mission from God is to, to be sent out by God to prepare the world for the coming of the Messiah. The Messiah is coming. The Messiah is this one that God has promised will save God's people from their oppressors and from their enemies. John says, I've been sent out to prepare the world for this Messiah. I've been sent out for that purpose. And then they, they ask him, uh, how do you have authority to do this? How do you have authority to baptize? And he points them forward to the one that he proclaims, saying that his authority rests on that man's shoulders. He says, I am baptizing with water, but among you Jews, coming out from the Jews, will be one that you yourselves do not know. Even though he is Jewish like you and comes from that lineage and that heritage, you will not know him because he truly will be the Son of God. In verse 27, John says that the man coming after him, the man that he has been sent to prepare the way for, is so immeasurably greater than he himself is. That John is not even worthy to untie the strap of that man's sandals. They question John's authority. And John's response may be surprising. If someone questioned my authority, I might say, well, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm the pastor. Of course I can do that. But John doesn't point to his own authority. He points past himself and says, there's someone greater than me who, who gives me this authority. And then he debases himself and humbles himself in the face of that one who would come after him who's far greater. He says, uh, I baptize only because of his greatness and what he has done and what he will do and of who he is. I'm not even worthy to bend down and untie the strap of his sandal on his filthy feet. John is clearly... In all of his responses, you're pointing forward to someone who is greater than him. He says, I am not the Christ. I am not, uh, 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 I am not coming and doing this with my own authority. I am coming here to prepare for someone greater than me. And the third time he responds, he says, uh, I don't do this on my own, but there is someone who's coming after me who is far greater than me. In all of John's responses, he clearly indicates, I am coming to prepare you all for someone greater who comes next. And he is coming. He's right around the corner. Verse 28 concludes the text uh, with a summary from the author. The author says, these things took place in Bethany across the Jordan where John was baptizing. John the Baptist had gone out across the river Jordan into the wilderness. And he started to proclaim to the people that you must repent for the day of the Lord is near. Come and be baptized for the repentance of sins. And people came to him in flocks and in droves and were being baptized by John. And even Jesus himself, we'll see, comes to John to be baptized. Next week we'll look at the following verse, verses 29 through 34. And we'll see that Jesus himself came back to John. But this all happened while John was in the wilderness across the Jordan River where people were flocking to him for baptism. So, church, this is the end of our text in the book of John. I think all told and all together, the purpose of this text is to show John's testimony about who Jesus is. That's the center of, of this whole text, right? It begins out at the beginning, and this is the testimony of Jesus. John the Baptist. When, when people sent, uh, when the Jews sent a delegation to him to ask who he was, he gave a testimony, not about himself, but about someone who is to come after him. So all of this text comes together to show us John's testimony about who Jesus is. John came on the scene offering baptism. He came on the scene calling people to receive baptism by water, a baptism 
of repentance. The people questioned his authority. The rulers at the time questioned his authority. They said, are you the Messiah? Are you Elijah? Are you the prophet? If not, then who gave you the authority to do these things? In our text, we saw that John says, I baptize because someone immeasurably great is about to come on the scene. He is the Messiah. He will save us from our sins. He will deliver this people from their fate. The fact that John testifies this about Jesus lends to Jesus' credibility. And that's why I think the text is here. And that's what I think we learn from the text. We can know that Jesus truly is the Messiah. We can know that he truly is the Son of God because John came in advance and proclaimed it. God promised this would happen, right? In, in uh, Malachi 4 or 5 and in Deuteronomy and all throughout the Old Testament, in Isaiah specifically, promised that he would send someone to prepare the way for the Messiah. And John is that person, and he points forward to someone greater than so, church, in this text, we see that John prepared for the coming of the Messiah by testifying that Jesus truly was about to come. Looking back on these verses in John chapter 1, I have one last question for us, and we'll spend a little bit of time answering it. How are we supposed to respond to this news? How are we supposed to respond to John's testimony that the, the, he proclaimed the Messiah is about to come and the Messiah's name is Jesus? What are we supposed to do with this message that John came to prepare the people for the coming of the Messiah? Here's what we must do. We must prepare for the coming of Christ. Prepare for the coming of Christ. John predicted that the Messiah would come and the Messiah truly did come in Jesus Christ. John predicted that Jesus would come after him, would, would die for our sins. God predicted that he would die for our sins, and John pointed forward to this man. Jesus Christ was miraculously born of a virgin. Uh, just like Cameron said last week, the eternal Son of God came to this earth and took on flesh. He was miraculously born of a virgin. He lived a perfect life, and at the end of his life, he died for our sins. We deserved to die that death. But Jesus died in our place. We broke God's law, but Jesus paid the penalty. And then on the third day after his death, Jesus rose again from the grave, victoriously defeating sin and death in our place. And now the risen Jesus Christ, the risen Messiah, is alive today. At this very moment, he is alive and seated at the right hand of the throne of God. This same Jesus, this same risen Messiah that John pointed forward to and we look back to, this same Jesus is coming back again one day, and he's coming back soon, very soon. So church, what must we do? We must prepare for his coming. When he comes again, the Bible says he will come to judge the world. Every sinner will be found guilty before him and will be banished to everlasting punishment in hell. But those who have put their trust in Jesus will be vindicated on that day. Just as Jesus was raised from the dead and just as he was victorious over sin, so too will we be victorious over sin and raised from the dead on that day when he comes again. Amen. Sin will not condemn us on that day if we turn to the Lord Jesus Christ and trust in his name. So that is first and foremost how we must prepare for Jesus Jesus' second coming is we must repent of our sins and trust in Jesus. Amen. If you have never repented of your sins and trusted in Jesus, then you must do so today. Prepare for Jesus' second coming by turning away from your sin. We call this turning from sin repentance. Repentance. That means to lay aside your sin, turn away from it, don't look back to it, but look forward to something greater. Forgiveness and hope in Jesus Christ. Turning from sin means turning toward Christ. It means putting your faith and trust in Him. Trusting that He can save you from your sin. He can forgive you from your sin. And that you are safe in Him. He can give you new life and new hope if you turn from sin and turn toward Him. So come to Him today. Put your trust in Him from this day forward. He truly can save you. 
After this, we Christians must continue to prepare for his coming. We must do all that we can to stay away from that sin that we claim to have repudiated. We must continue to trust in him with all that we have and all that we are. We must do all that we can to stay away from sin and remain faithful to the Lord. One particular sin that is often exposed around the holidays is unforgiveness. Oh, unforgiveness pops up around the holidays much more clearly than it does at some other times. We can sometimes be really good at holding a grudge against the people that we love most, right? We can sometimes be really, really good at that. This is so true with family, close family, siblings, uh, cousins, people we grew up with, people who love us most and are closest to us. We can hold grudges against them far better than we can against many other people. Sometimes a sibling or a cousin or a close relative does something that is so hurtful, it's hard for us to forgive that person, right? Even after they apologize, we can sometimes hold on to that pain and hold on to that bitterness that's caused by that rift between us and someone so close to us. Of course, this causes tension with our families, and if it's family we don't see all the time, but we see them at Christmas, that tension pops up, and it can lead to dramatic Christmas celebrations, can't it? <laughs> Very dramatic, often. Uh, you hear stories of people coming back from Thanksgiving and Christmas with uh, loud yelling matches caused by bitterness clung to and held on to. Church, we must prepare for Christ coming by lay us, laying aside all of the hurt and all of the pain that our family has caused us. We cannot remain in unforgiveness. We cannot continue to cling to that bitterness for the hurt we've experienced, but we must forgive to lay it aside and to cling to God has forgiven us. God truly has forgiven us. We have, have sinned against him immeasurably. We've done immeasurably wicked sin against God, and he's forgiven us fully and completely in Christ. So why can't we turn and forgive that measurable sin they have committed against us? Church, we must forgive our loved ones this Christmas and put aside every grudge that you have been clinging to. Prepare for the coming of Christ. And finally, church, we must prepare for the coming of Christ by celebrating together what he has done for us and what he is about to do when he returns. That's what Christmas is all about, right? It's about celebrating that Christ has come to, to take on flesh. He was born of a virgin. He came to redeem us from our sin, to offer us life and hope. And we're celebrating that this season. So we must Prepare for his coming by celebrating and celebrating uh, with great joy and great enthusiasm. Christmas is all about the coming of Christ. 2,000 years ago, he came, and soon he is coming again. Let's celebrate. When you gather together with your families in just a few short weeks, remember that Christ took on flesh, becoming like us to redeem us from our sins so that we might rejoice in him, praise him, glorify him, celebrate him. And especially celebrate him this season. As you celebrate him this season, don't forget to tell the Christmas story of what God has done to your kids, to your relatives, to your, your siblings, your neighbors, anyone who will listen. Tell them how you're celebrating this season, what Christ has done for you. In ten minutes or so, we're going to go downstairs. We're going to have a meal together, a celebratory meal. Uh, to celebrate the holidays, Thanksgiving and Christmas combined. And as we do, we're not celebrating food. We're not celebrating togetherness. We're celebrating with food and with togetherness. And what we're celebrating is Christ has done something immeasurably great for us in coming to this earth to redeem us from our sins. And he's about to do something immeasurably great when he returns to end wickedness once and for all and to bring us to God to be with him forever. Amen. So the meal we're about to have together is not just for fun. It's not just so we can spend time together, but it's for a greater purpose. As we have fun, as we spend time together, as we have normal conversations across the table, as we talk about weather and the Cincinnati Bengals and whatever else we talk about, we're doing so for the purpose of celebrating what God has done and what he has given us in Jesus Christ. So as you eat this good meal and spend time together, remember what we are celebrating. The eternal Son of God took on flesh. He was born of a virgin. He lived a perfect life. He died for our sins, and he rose again so that we might be redeemed and glorify God with every fiber of our being. So church, prepare for the coming of Christ.
Let's pray to him. Oh, Lord God, thank you. We praise you and we celebrate today that you have come to this earth to die for our sins and that you raised again to new life. Oh, Lord, we thank you for coming to take on flesh so that our flesh may be redeemed. We thank you for sending Jesus to live the perfect life, the life that we could not live. We thank you for sending him to die the death that we deserved. And we thank you that he rose again from the grave to offer us a new life that we could never have gained for ourselves. Lord, help us to celebrate this exuberantly. Help us to celebrate this without the weight of unforgiveness, of, of holding on to grudges that holds us back as we are supposed to be celebrating you. Help us to celebrate joyfully and exuberantly not cling on to those past hurts, especially from those closest to us. Oh Lord God, we thank you for your word in the book of John. Help us to continue to understand your word and to live it out and to apply it rightly in our lives. God, help us to honor you in all we do. Oh Lord, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.